do this. <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, we have the welcome packets, right? For uh, So um, I would especially like to welcome anyone who is here for the very first time. I know we have uh, some, I guess, from Palm Desert, right? Yeah, welcome here. If you're here for the first time uh, and know what we're about or not, we have a packet for you. So if you'll just raise your hand. Uh, here's one over here. Welcome, welcome. Here's another one. Oh, good. And so uh, we hope that you um, feel so at home that, that it feels like home instantly. That's what we, we would like. Uh, this is not where we usually meet. And um, we usually meet in the rec center down the road, but a few times a year, until we get our own facility, uh, we are displaced. So we get to, you know, kind of pack our tent and go somewhere else. So thank you for all convening here. So um, our vision uh, in this wonderful community is awakening personal transformation. Each one of us is here about personal transformation. And, and the way we do that, the mission, is that we teach tools for positive change. So hopefully, yeah. if I'm doing my job, you will get some tools for positive change today. Uh, I'm happy to be back. I was gone for four Sundays. It really got to be, I don't know, kind of nice. Um, but, I'm, <laughs> but I'm very happy to be back. And I'm very happy that uh, you have wonderful, wonderful speakers. So I'd like to thank um, Reverend Catherine Revoir, Reverend Mary Marie Shelton, Reverend Catherine Sox, and Reverend Josephine Smith. So uh, I, I chose those. Yes, thank you. I chose them for you. So um, we have a theme that is a year-long theme, and that is about creating a world that works for everyone. That's our global vision creating a world that works for everyone. And the new theme for July is what jo uh, Bodhi told you, which is loving kindness and forgiveness. So every week, uh, the notes that come from home office also have a quote. And this, the quote for this week uh, is from the Global Heart Vision. And it is, we see a worldwide culture in which forgiveness, whether for errors, injustices, or debts, is the norm. So I want to just repeat the above because I want us to be firmly aware of these themes before I go into what I'm going to say. Because of course, you know me, if, if we talk about forgiveness for something that is easy to forgive, what's the tool for positive change? So we're going to be talking about difficult things. So I want us to be firmly grounded in this themes, the, in the themes which are a world that works for everyone, and this one using loving kindness and forgiveness with this um, wonderful idea that we see a worldwide culture in which forgiveness, whether for errors, injustices, or debts, is the norm. So when I was away from you all of June, there was a lot that happened, correct? I mean, I was in England right before Brexit, and I saw... Uh, lots and lots of signs that said stay in, and a lot of signs that said leave, and uh, people were shocked, absolutely shocked, at the outcome. But before Brexit, we had the shootings in Orlando. Uh, coming back to this country, we have the rising insanity of the political scene. Um, we have the concern for the environment, and then Istanbul happened very recently. And so, if our teaching cannot help us hold these, these things that happen in our world, then our philosophy is not worth very much. So to start out with the message that I have for you today, I would like to actually rewrite the quote, the quote about we see a worldwide culture. Here's the way I would write it. <clears throat> we see a worldwide culture in which forgiveness for errors, injustices, deaths, Violence, hatred, betrayal, instigation of fear, intolerance, wastefulness, intentional harm, selfishness, theft, and lying is the norm. That forgiveness is the norm for those things. So we need to talk about what forgiveness means. Forgiveness does not mean, oh, never mind. 
It does not mean burying our head in the sand or uh, figuring out where we're going to immigrate to. Um, it, and it is not avoiding or mollifying or minimizing the pain that is in the world. It is, it is working for justice. It is working for improving conditions. And it is not becoming a victim to those conditions or allowing fear to ruin our time here. So, Ernest Holmes has a great, great quote that if we internalize the meaning of that, we would be completely in the healed place. So I want to spend some time on this. Ernest Holmes, who was the founder of, uh, of our philosophy, said, we must not be disturbed by the contradiction of objective experience. We shall have to know that the truth we announce is superior to the condition which it is to change. So let's kind of unpack that a bit. We must not be disturbed by conditions. What Ernest Holmes is asking us to do is to witness, to be present for these acts of violence around our world and to not be disturbed by them. To simply say, this is the world. This is, this is what is happening in the world now. Then he says, we shall have to know that the truth we announce is superior to the condition which it is to change. So what he's asking us to do is announce a truth that feels opposite of what we objectively see. So where there is violence, we proclaim peace. That is the reality. That is the truth that Ernest Holmes is asking us to announce. And in our philosophy, it certainly makes sense because we are not going to change the conditions if we focus on the conditions, right? We only are an agent of change for the conditions when we turn from the conditions, and that does not mean putting our head in the sand. It's meaning that is an appearance, and the appearance is not the truth of my being. It is not the truth of God. The truth of God is peace. So we announce we announce this world that works for all, with, that is filled with loving kindness and fills with forgiveness. And when that is not happening in the world, we forgive it instead of complaining about it. And my title for the talk today is, I Have No Complaints. So when we look out at what happened in Istanbul, when we look out at what happened at Orlando, we are called to say, Humanity is better than that. And I call forth a world in which peace reigns. I call forth, I announce a world in which forgiveness is the norm. I announce a world where oneness prevails instead of separation. So I brought the forgiveness pillow today. And um, this was long, long, long time ago. This was a, a project that a student did for foundations. And, and it talks about harmless passage through my mind. This is the definition that I really love uh, for forgiveness. And that is, when I think of Istanbul, when I think of ISIS, when I think of Orlando, when I think of, um, of the ministers who preach hatred, mm. I, my work is to see these people as forgetting their way. And I open, I open my heart to embrace them in compassion. Instead of saying retribution, violence back, payback, I need protection, and I'm not saying this is easy, but we are in a world today where this work is needed more so than it 
any other time. I, you know, I don't know if it's more than any other time because when I was over there in England, there are many, many, many remembrances of the two world wars and, uh, and, and the history of the English crown, which is just, you know, hacking people. Uh, but, uh, <laughs> so, I think sometimes that we live in a real boot camp dimension. That, you know, we are, uh, violence has been in the history of humankind forever. And the only thing that will heal that is not more violence, but greater love. So I'm passing my pillow around. You can bless it or receive a blessing from it. Just uh, let it be in my car when I go home. <laughs> um, so if we do not start with complaint, if we come from the place of oneness first, if we say, one of, one of us, one of us did this, one of us, shot up this place, one of us was a um, suicide bomber, whatever. Not, the news keeps them so separate from us, you know, they are <coughs> depraved, they are different, they are um, horrible, evil people. They are, they have lost their way of the oneness that we know. And so the healing for that is to start with the oneness that we know, look directly at these events in the world, feel it, and know that in order for us to co-create a world that works for everyone, we begin with connection and a tenderized heart rather than a defended heart and separation. It's as simple as that. We keep our heart open and realize that the only healing in this world is a tenderized heart where whatever impacts it, we give back love. Whatever impacts it, we give back love. The tenderized heart, the open heart, that takes the suffering of the world and gives back love. So if I had a PowerPoint up here now, I would, we're going to talk about four things for huge forgiveness. And I'm going to repeat them over and over again, and then I'm going to have you repeat them because you're not seeing them visually. But it's really important for us to see these things. And the first one is to give up victimhood. That idea where they're doing it to me, I have to protect myself, I have to stay at home, I have to own a gun, whatever it is. I, and, you know, I guns, you can own guns, but what... What we want is to give up that feeling of fear and protection and complaint and attacks back. So that in this world where these things happen, guess what? This is the world in which we are workers in the field of the Lord. This is what, if, if, if we believe in choice, if we believe that there are no accidents, do you think that you didn't choose to be here at this time with these things going on and this is the field in which you work? I believe that I chose this time. Do you, uh, well, let's have a share. <laughs> Thank you. I totally agree and I also wanted to add that I think that the message that we hear in the news is that ISIS is growing. Our United States defense tactics are not succeeding in whatever they are doing, which is certainly about violence, and that the recruits and the growth of ISIS comes from the very, very poor and the very uneducated, and the more uneducated and the more poor, the more likely to become a recruit. These are people who get food, clothing, shelter, and some training, and they are grateful to survive their poverty, and I think that... Um, if we were to send, you know, a voter messages to our representatives that education, food, clothing, shelter, support, and humanity is going to what be what stops this. Thank so, you. so what we heard there is her work, absolutely her work, which I this this is the answer to Emma Curtis Hopkins saying. If we feel there is work to do, we may be certain we're the very ones to do it. So, 
Uh, I, I'm sure that everyone has some sort of something to do that is welling up within you, and that's great because that is the opposite of victimhood. That is taking responsibility. Victimhood and responsibility. We stay out of victimhood and we step into whatever it is that is our thing to do to create a world that works for everyone. And one of the things that we do is announce the truth that is superior to the conditions. We give love in exchange for anything else. So that's the first thing. Letting go of victimhood. The second thing is working for change. Working for healing. Doing whatever it is that we see that is ours to do in addition to announcing that I am co-creating a world that works for everyone and I give love no matter what the stimulus is. So the big step is to announce that truth and then to follow it with action. To follow violence with peace and hatred with love. So um, something happened to me this week. I, I love it. I love it when the universe, more and more and more, the universe just gives me my talks. So, um, so working for change and staying out of victimhood. What happened, uh, actually it was, it, it culminated this week, but it started when I was in England. So when I was in England, uh, I received an email, CC forwarded me an email from someone who looked like he wanted um, a minister to do a wedding. And so um, I was communicating with this man named James Wood, Woodhusen or Woodhausen, however you say it. And um, so I said, I'm, I'm uh, out of the country right now. Uh, when is your wedding and where is your wedding so I can see if it's in my, if the, if the date is free. So he emailed me back, very chatty, I hope you're doing well, uh, here's my date, here's the place where I want to be married, and if you could pray for my dad who's very ill, I'd really appreciate it. So I emailed back and said, um, great, I'm going to put this on my calendar, and he wanted to know my fee, so I said, well, my fee for a wedding in San Francisco is uh, $600, or if there's a rehearsal, it'll be $700. So he emails me back, no problem. Tell me uh, where I should mail the check. Let me have your address. So uh, I gave him the P.O. box of the office, uh, not my home address. And so uh, he said, I'm mailing the check, the certified check today, uh, and uh, it'll be there when you get back. Uh, make sure that you cash it right away or deposit it. So he sent me a couple more emails saying, uh, did you get the check? And um, uh, have you deposited the check? So I get back to the office this week and uh, Cece gives me this big registered envelope. Mm -hmm. And remember, the, my fee was $700 that we agreed on. The check made out to me was $3,550. <laughs> so I, lo I mean, I mean, I look at this check and and uh, I, I I called uh, actually our, our field leader uh, for my denomination, John Waterhouse said, "Don't cash it," and um, and he said, "You know, this is a scam." And I, I I I failed to understand how this person could get my money, but nonetheless, I I just looked at the check for a while. And, um, and it looked, it was written on a company. So I Googled the company. It was a real company in Boston, Massachusetts, same address. So I called them up and I was given to the fraud department. And I told them the whole story that I was gonna do this wedding and they charged $700 and then I got this huge, huge check. And um, they asked for the numbers on the check, the track, you know, uh, all that. I looked, it was a real, gave them the numbers, they looked it up in their database and they said, uh, we do not have a check with those numbers oh. for that amount, it, it, the check is bad. And I was expecting them actually to tell me what to do next. Uh, you know, like, what, like give, me, give us the name of the guy and we'll take it from here. Right. No. They, they did nothing like this. And, and, and I was feeling like creeped out, if you can imagine, that this was happening. And so then, this is what I 
love about being your minister because I looked at the theme for the month. <laughs> Loving kindness and forgiveness. And I decided to be a minister and a mom and write this letter. James. <laughs> I have realized that your request for a wedding officiant and your strangely huge payment to me are entirely fraudulent. I checked with Gazelle Inc. and the check you wrote, seemingly from their company, is not real. I'm not exactly sure how you expected to benefit from this game, but I would surely it would surely have been at my expense. May I take this opportunity <laughs> to tell you that your behavior hurts you. It hurts your soul, in addition to hurting others. It contributes to mistrust in the world and to people living in fear. I do not want to live in a world that is run by fear, and I think you probably do not want to either. Here, here's it. If you were my son, I would be ashamed of you. <laughs> if you truly have a father who is ill, I hope he does not know this side of you. Please, let this be a change point in your life. I know you are better than this. This scam of yours was not very skillful. <laughs> and I think you would do much better to find a legitimate line of work. I do wish you the best, James. Wow. <laughs> well, you know what? I did not feel like a victim. <laughs> and I felt like I had done my work. I had promoted peace. I had promoted the world that I want to see. I don't know if this kid will ever do, uh, will keep, I don't know what he'll do, but I did my part. And I showed the universe around me that, uh, that I'm not a victim and I am willing to do my part. So those are the first two things. Give up victimhood, work for change. <clears throat> and the next thing is see the good, see the good. Um, see how people help each other. You know, one of the things I love, and I loved it when I was away, is to go on my Facebook page and see all of you loving each other. I think that is so great when I see my community living in the larger community together and loving each other. I just want, I, I think this is wonderful. And so, um, what we do for each other and when we notice that that is good and that is loving, when we emphasize that and when we even thank each other for doing good for other people, that magnifies that in the world. So the, the piece here that I want is my 4th of July piece as well. Because I want to read to you what is on the Statue of Liberty. It ostensibly is about immigrants. But I'm not talking about immigrants. I'm not talking about po a political position on immigrants. I am talking about this statement being what happens in our hearts. Give me your tired, mm -hmm. your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free, mm -hmm. the wretched refuse of your teeming shore. Send these the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. What if that was written on each of our hearts? And that as we see our, our beloveds in the world who are in trouble, who think they can get by with a scam, that we say to them, here is my open heart for you. I forgive you and see better in you. And I am ready to be a helping hand. And then that the last is be courageous. You know, seeing the good, announcing the truth in the face of current circumstances is absolutely huge work. Announcing, announcing the truth when all we hear from the news is how insane things are. And then to say, I don't see people that way. I see people as inherently good 
and then to follow that with action. That is absolutely huge work, and we are the ones to do it. You know, years ago, Jane Houston said, we're the ones we've been waiting for. And it's no more, it's no more true now than it ever, ever has been. It is the truest now than it has been. This is, I'm going to read to you a little piece by Chris Bakke, who used to be um, an officer at the um, ION Center. And what he's talking about is the opportunity that we have right now to change the world. And this is what he says. The system sensitivity, or we could say the world sensitivity, is increasing as the system moves into unstable, non-equilibrium conditions. I think we are there. I think we are in unstable, non-equilibrium conditions. And what he's saying is that the ability to shift things is it, it's we have to use less force, less impact, to make big changes now when it's already in um, imbalance already non-equilibrium conditions. The more free-floating energy there is in the system available to be catalyzed into new forms. We do not have to be able to see at the outset how our seemingly private decisions will impact the systems we are a part of or how they will make a difference, but we can trust that they will. Every time one of us acts with this kind of courage and clarity for the collective good, the transformation of humanity gains momentum. So this is the perfect time. We are here. We are the ones. This is the field of the Lord that we are working in. And our work has never been needed more. So no complaints. And this is our work. I mean, you bought a ticket now. <laughs> Don't miss out. Don't sit on the sidelines of eating popcorn. You know, live this transformation of the world. So here are the points. And I want you to repeat them. I give up victimhood. I give up victimhood. I work for change. I work for change. I see the good. I see the good. I am courageous. I am courageous. And here's the closing one. The world is changing and I am on the transition team. The world is changing and I am on the transition team. Yay! Okay. So, one more story. In conclusion, um, so I, 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 this is a new harp. This is a new harp, and I took it to England. And, um, and so I had a really profound experience with this harp um, at a, a little place uh, called Dosmary Pool. Now, you can, you can Google Dosmary Pool. It's in Cornwall. Um, it is um, uh, D-O-Z-M-A-R-Y, Dosmary Pool. And um, it's supposedly, it's, it's, a, it's a nondescript little, little lake. It's a little lake, and there's just grass all around it. There's no it, it, pretty rocks or cliffs or waterfalls or anything like that. It looks kind of like a flooded field. Um, but supposedly... This is the place where Arthur received Excalibur from the Lady of the Lake. And so there is a little bitty sign on this little bitty two-lane road that sends you on a one-lane dirt road to Dosmary Pool. So we go down there in the van, and we're about 13 people in this van, and uh, Glenn, our leader, tells this amazing story about how when Arthur was ready to receive his mission, his mission for uniting the kingdoms, that Merlin took Arthur to the edge of Dosmary Pool, and the Lady of the Lake rose up out of the lake yeah. with Excalibur in her hand and gave it to Arthur. Mm -hmm. And her words were, this is the most powerful sword in the world. It can cut through stone, it can cut through steel, but it is not as powerful as the sheath that holds it. So guard well the sheath, because no one will die from their wounds if this sword and this sheath are kept together. 
the meaning that we interpret from that is that the world needs a balance of masculine and feminine energy. We absolutely need to be courageous and go forth in telling our truth. But we also need the feminine qualities, which we all have, of intuition, open-heartedness, forgiveness, seeing the best in people, and actually knowing where to put our force with the intuitive knowing of when to act and when to be still. So it is the balance of the masculine and feminine. And so I was, uh, we were all getting out of the van in order to go down to the pool. And Glenn was saying, um, I want you all to go down there and ask the lady of the lake, what is your assignment? And stay there until you receive your assignment. And then leave something for the Lady of the Lake. And mostly when we go to sacred sites, what we leave is a hair. It's part of our DNA, our energy, in order to say yes, I accept the blessings of this site. I accept the blessings that I received today. I accept the mandate that is given to me by the Lady of the Lake. So we were all getting out of our, out of the van, and Cameron, the other leader, said, "Carol, why don't you take your harp?" And I, I didn't know what to play, and then this came to me. I am one with the heart of the mother. I am one with the heart of love. I am one with the heart of the Father. I am one with love. So as we go into the inner work, and we sing this through a few times, <coughs> maybe you can ask your own <coughs> higher self, what is my next assignment? What is mine to do? in a world that works for everyone. So we'll sing this through a few times, and then you just do your own searching. I am one with the heart of the mother. I am one with the heart of love. I
already there. It is already given to us. For surely we would never be given an assignment without the means to carry it out. The divine plan, if there is one, is that everything that is needed is available. All that we need to give is prepared for us by the eternal working of our own soul in connection with our souls. And so may it be that each one of us gives the gift that we came to give. May we be heroic, courageous, wise, and beautiful. Just the way God created us. As I was thinking about forgiveness, I realized it's not always just about forgiving something. 